I am sitting here with Jean Masse from Advanced Physical Therapy in North Carolina. You were in Raleigh, Durham or? Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill. Okay. That was probably the wrong thing to say. Uh, wait, so that's, that's North Carolina. Raleigh, Durham is Duke? No, well, Durham is Duke. Uh, Chapel Hill is the, is UNC. And who's you know, at the Tar State? Heels are. Where's NC State? NC State is Raleigh. All right. Yes. Okay, all right NC yeah. State is Raleigh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's local politics. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So from Advanced Physical Therapy in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and she will be discussing today the two generic patterns of scoliosis, which are patho and non-patho. And why don't I hand it over to Jean to uh, explain what both of those mean? Yeah, sure, Neil. Um, so we're going to present, and this is adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, meaning we see these, these two curve patterns most commonly in teens who develop spine curves. And we use these two curves as a framework for understanding when you might see something that doesn't look like this. It's like we have some sort of reference. Oh, that doesn't look like a typical patho curve or a typical non-patho curve, which are the two curves I'm going to present. But we need to, to have some sort of reference to know when we're seeing something that's away from that, that sort of standard. Um, and so we're, again, coming back to idio idiopathic scoliosis that, that is typically an adolescent onset. You can see it in juveniles, you can see it in infants. We can even see older adults develop curves that haven't had them before. But the premise that we use for understanding all those other types of curves comes generally from our understanding of adolescent curves. Um, and in postural restoration, we have our sort of version of the curves that the scoliosis world um, typically has lingo and language about. So um, when I present an understanding from our posture restoration framework, I'd also probably would be helpful to talk about terminology that other, um, other practitioners in the world are using radiologists and uh, Schroth practitioners with scoliosis and medical doctors all have their own way of referencing curves. So okay. um, if I start with just basically the understanding of what's going on with scoliosis, scoliosis is a three-dimensional torsional deformity of the spine, but then everything that's attached to the spine. So if I use this towel as, a, as an example of a straight structure, and of course, in normal human spine, there's gonna be a little bit of a kyphosis in the thoracic spine, a little bit of a lumbar lordosis, but it's okay. We're just gonna assume that this is a non-twisted spine, right? So that this spine can go into flexion, this spine can go into side bending, it can go into extension, and it can actually twist and then twist. And so you you're starting from this basis of, of neutrality, if you will, as, as far as the, the joint relationship to the one above and the one below. When you have a scoliosis, this is a system that's under torsion. And so torsion is just uh, an experience of a, of a twisting force. And so the towel is a good way to, to represent that torsion. If I keep twisting this towel, eventually you're gonna see it start to turn into uh, a coil or, or like a spring. It's not two dimensional because you can look at this mm -hmm from any angle and see it's making a, a, a coil. It's, it's, um, it's like a not double, just a frontal it's like plane. A helix it's like a, double helix. Yeah, right. And so I've kind of created what I, what I might call is the first type of curve pattern we call in postural restoration as a non-patho curve where in my vision, this prominence or this C shape is uh, concave on the left side and convex on the right side. And, and we see that in 90%, this right thoracic curve, we see this in 90% of adolescent curves. And we call this non-pathologic because the body isn't really fighting it. There's, 
there's nothing really trying to counter it below significantly or above. And in medical terminology, they might call this a, um, a major curve, or they might also call this a um, dextroscoliosis, meaning the curve is on the right side. Okay. Can, if could, this curve was... Yeah, could you just point out what? Because convex and concave can be very confusing to Right, people. I need one more hand, right? Oh, so, right. Um, so yeah, the concave side is the inner side of the curve and the convex side, and the curves are named by the side of the convexity. This curve is gonna be named by this part of the curve, not the inside of the curve. So when the convexity is on the right, like it is right now, mm -hmm. that's gonna be um, a, that's gonna be called a dextroscoliosis or right-sided scoliosis. Okay. So the first kind, kind of curve we see is when there is a major curve or, or um, a, a prominence on the right side generally of the rib cage. Then what can happen, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's a progression of this, is the body, this is a big curve to deal with. And what can happen with this, with this non-pathologic situation is if you look at where my bottom hand is and you look where my top hand is, you can see there might be a significant deviation of the hips where my ha bottom hand is to the left because of this right-sided curve. And, and the system might decide, okay, it's okay with that. If you look at somebody with a non-patho curve, they're going to look more asymmetric than someone who has the next type of curve we're going to talk about. They might look more asymmetric because that curve is such a big influence and the, it brings the pelvis out to the left and it makes it look like the trunk is very far to the right. And so that's one of the ways clinically we can look at a person and if their hips are out to the left and their trunk is way over to the right, we're suspicious that they have maybe a non-pathologic curve type. Okay. But what can happen, we see in other people, is that this bottom side starts to try to make up for that right side large discrepancy by actually becoming pathologically lax in some of the restraining structures over here on the right, like the right iliolumbar ligament or the right quadratus lumborum, start to actually let go so that the body can come into a little bit more balance. And, and now we're seeing what we maybe call a, a, a major, major curve or, a, or a, a double curve, whereas, or in other stroke practitioners call this a four curve because there's two obvious curves and then there's a curve below and a curve above that kind of bring the head and the pelvis underneath us. Okay, so, so that, we call this- Did that yeah. pelvis just move to the right? It sure did, yeah. The pelvis moved to the right, but the lumbar spine stayed to the left. And so we know something had to dissociate, some restraining structures had to give way for that pelvis to leave the left lumbar spine. And so this person, we're a little more concerned about lumbar instability, right? Because really this primary curve here up on the right, this curve right up here, should really just have the, that pelvis go out to the left. And if that pelvis is coming back to the right, we, and there is this presence of this right thoracic curve, um, or sometimes not, it's usually, if you see a left lumbar curve, you're suspicious of lumbar instability, just because that means the pelvis is going to the right and the lumbar spine's on the left. So those are our two main curve types. Okay. And, and in, in, in PRI, uh, I think the terminology is, is most helpful in trying to understand what it is going on in the system. Um, because for a curve to, to come into balance with that primary right-sided curve, there has to be this pathologic compensation. And that's usually at the expense of the restraining structures in the right lumbar spine area. That's a, you know, a lot of, I've gotten this, these questions and comments and I have never really had a great answer except that it was probably some sort of pathological event that people will insist that their uh, imaging, whether it's in, uh, is it usually MRI or x-rays that are 
or ball? X-rays are the things we interact with the most. MRIs are going to give you also a, a lot more insight as to what's going on with the soft tissue and the connective tissue, but X-rays give us a lot of information for what's happening um, in, in the bony structure, which is how we can diagnose the, the different curve types. Okay, so they'll often say, well, my, you know, my X-ray shows that my lumbar spine is to the left. And, you know, I know that the typical, you know, the, the, the typical PRI model of looking at things with this normal curve, the lumbar spine is gonna be oriented to the right. Uh, so if it is to the left, if they are correct and it is to the left, and I have no reason to doubt them, that just means that they have to realize, hopefully, from our point of view, that something have, something out of the ordinary had to happen for that to occur. So I never Very likely. I, I, I never say it can't happen, but I try to get the point across that it's just not normal. So we have things that are normal. And then things that are normal in the sense that we see them happen, but something had to go, you know, some rule had to be broken of biomechanics. Exactly. That's exactly. So I, I anything just, can happen. Yeah. Right? But yeah. it's a question of did you sacrifice your tissue integrity for that to happen? And in that case, you're a little further away from the original pattern. Okay. Uh, so when you, um, you said it's not necessarily a progression. Can you touch on that? Because a lot of people will fear that if they have, if something shows up, it always becomes, well, how, how do we stop it from getting worse? But what you're saying is not, there's no, there's no absolute progression to everything. So can you just kind of go over that? Yeah, I think, well, what I was referring to in, I think when I was describing the curves is that a three curve doesn't necessarily progress to a four curve. So a non so a non patho doesn't necessarily. Sorry, yeah, I'm using I'm making my own mistake. Is that's right? A non patho three curve is what the Schroth practitioners call it. Okay. Uh, with that imbalance, it doesn't necessarily progress into a pathologic curve. Some older adults can still have non pathologic curves. Although I will say, working primarily with older adults almost all of them have some degree of lumbar spine instability. So even if the curve doesn't change, even if those hips still stay out to the left, we start to see wear and tear just because there's such a, there's such a force imbalance going on through the system day after day after day. So we do tend to see some giving way or weakening of those lumbar restraining ligaments and connective tissues. But a three curve doesn't necessarily progress to a four curve. We see young kids that come right out of, right out of their healthy spine into a four, into a pathologic curve type. And there again, we come back and fall on the term idiopathic, which is, we don't know why, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know why one system might do one thing and another system does another. We know everybody's asymmetric. We know everybody has to deal with gas and gravity. But the thing that's always variable is how does that person's neurology handle, handle those conditions? Can you right? explain that? Because that will be a, uh, what, is it, what does that mean, how each person's neurology handles the conditions? Because that's a, that's a complicated uh, thought. Right, right. And it's, it's a good out for me because it allows for anything to be possible, right? Because we know as soon as we're sure of one thing, somebody walks in the door with the thing that we said, well, how does that happen, right? So, right? so there are some constants, right? We know from postural restoration that we have a system that is asymmetric. You know, we, we have made cases for that over and over with organ placement, with brain hemisphere dominance. Um, um, and we know everybody is living on this planet under gravity, right? So it's pushing down on us. And we know we're all experiencing a need to, to push against it with our respiratory system. And for whatever reason, that asymmetry, that downward pressure, that outward pushback um, can be handled by different people in different ways. And depending on maybe things that you were 
told as a kid about stand up straight, put your shoulders back, maybe because your system is inherently more ligamentous, more ligamentously lax, that you may find a posture that you're comfortable in and you may start sitting into that posture. And now gravity is influencing you in a little bit of a different way than it might influence me. And maybe you have a history of a head injury or maybe you had some birth trauma or maybe you have a one leg that's a little shorter than the other. I mean, maybe you got stung by a bee when you were nine years old and you were traumatized by it. You know, we all have these timelines and these unique sets of physiologic and anatomic you you know unique situations that make you you and me me and so um that's that's the mystery and the craft of trying to uh, reach each person you know in in the part of their story that impacts their spine the most you know with my job that's my job right right but but it's quite a challenge sometimes to figure out where in their timeline their system started to adapt in a way that was not therapeutic and not helpful to them. And so trying to pull that out and bring them back um, in, in that realm of their story is where uh, I think when we're successful, we do that well. Mm. And it's always a hard concept for people. And even for me, when I think of my own history that you know, my, because of these, certain set of circumstances which impacted my early life. My body had to figure out, my brain, my body had to figure out a way to adapt to the certain set of, set, to the certain set of circumstances that it itself brought about. So it's like your brain and body create the, the problem, if you want to call it that, and then they kind of freak out about the problem or they freak out about the way they're compensating for the problem, especially later in life, because it kind of, the compensation kind of breaks you down over time. And I actually had to go through my, numerous years and even now i still have to keep myself and keep in mind that my brain and body were trying to save me in a way like these compensations That's right. that cause us problems down the line that was how the organism so to speak was trying to keep us healthy well not, I mean, not healthy but safe to keep us from or falling cope but, at least that's yeah. right that's and right. so it's it's hard not to get angry at your own body for doing what it did Not, in a way. Yeah, well, or, or you could think about it as being really grateful to your body for doing what it did and thanking it and letting go of the belief that, that formed that strategy and saying, oh, thank goodness, I understand more about my, myself now and I can move in a direction that's more healing yeah. and efficient, yeah. right? Because the acceptance part is a big deal. When, when certain things are not gonna change, uh, if you have to tell a parent that, no, this is, you know, this is not going to change in the way that we would like, um, you know, psychologically, that's difficult for parents and for kids, like to say that, you know, this is how it's going to be for the long run. And you have to figure out, and we have to figure out a plan that's going to help you deal with the situation, you know, that you find yourself in. Right. Yes. But it can be pretty empowering to understand your system you know, you struggle with different things than I struggle with, and we all go through this process. Nobody's immune from this process of being challenged by what we're presented with in life and the tools that we develop along the way to uh, understand ourselves and to be patient with ourselves and to realize we're exactly where we're supposed to be today. And the information we're getting today is allowing us to work into uh, a more... Uh, a greater state of well-being you oh. know each yeah. day and, and that's empowering and if you're not moving in that direction you're being pulled back and we, we can even get into the idea of you know the autonomic nervous system then responding with a very um harsh response that fight or flight response that we know doesn't help any of our postural issues no, definitely does not so actually that would be i know we didn't necessarily plan for that but i think that's one of those little things that you know, I talk about this stuff a lot, but I, I'd like someone else with a ton of knowledge more than me uh, to explain that that thought pro the, to explain what you just said a little bit a little bit further. Well, I think you said it beautifully, Neil. When you talk about kind of this normal response of feeling really discouraged with our body, feeling really like we can't trust our body, 
feeling like our body has let us down and betrayed us and sort of feeling threatened by our own container that we have to manage day in and day out, what that does is it puts us in a fearful state. It puts us in a state of uncertainty and, and that creates stress. That creates a primitive fight, flight, or freeze response, right? And, and in the human body, that puts us in our running muscles. Our running muscles are our, our back extensors, our, our quads, and we get up on the balls of our feet and we're ready to go. Even though if we're not running, we don't have to be running to get into that state. If we're fearful, if we feel frozen or paralyzed, those muscles take over. And in a system that really needs to be able to be neutral and to be able to shift weight into those really efficient hip sockets, into that really to be able to empower your core and respiratory pump, that weight has to be down. You have to be grounded. You have to be able to use that gas up against the power of gravity that's pushing down on us. And if you're in that fight or flight position, you're not efficient. And you're not supposed to be efficient when you're in flight. You're supposed to be in flight, right? You're supposed to put all your effort into that one task. If you're an athlete, you're in fight or flight and that's okay. As long as when you're done, you come into a resting state. And a lot of people that feel chronically helpless or hopeless about their situation, they, they're in this, this vicious cycle of, of worry that keeps them posturally inefficient, that keeps them in pain, that brings them right back to their worry that, yep, I was sure I wasn't gonna be able to get out of this and I was right. And so it's, it's a loop that we try and enter into in some way, whether it's emotionally or physically, we can yeah. do it both both ways. Because that's an interesting point. Because um, I've been I've long thought about this: the fact that if you don't believe something is going to work, what are the chances it's going to work? Uh, like you know, when you when if a client comes in or a patient, a new patient comes in, and there's like there, I don't even know why I'm here. There's no way this can work. What are the chances? Is it a requirement that someone has to be open-minded? Is it a requirement, and as a child or a teenager, which is such a difficult time of life to begin with, what are the, what type of beliefs do they walk in with about their body? I mean, I can't imagine. I had, I had my own issues, but to also be scoliotic at that point in time, and I, I would have been, you know, in, in those years, there's no way I could have had an open mind. Uh, so would that have yeah. stopped anything from working, or would I have a little breakthrough, that little circuit breaker, where, wait a minute, I feel some, I feel a little bit better. So maybe this can work. And then maybe your thoughts go in the other direction. Like, wait, maybe there's some, there's some hope to this, but I'm always fascinated yeah. by it. some people. They're just, you know, the, you don't know if they have that belief that this can actually work. And if they're completely, you know, if they, if they believe it can't work, will it ever work for them? So I, if it is, what is the mindset of that teenager that comes in? Well, it's all over, it's all over the map, just like you would expect. We do have some tools that we can use like the SRS 22, which is a scoliosis um, uh, functional self, it's a self report self assessment. And that helps us get a gauge of if they're feeling very emotionally disturbed by their spine curve. And, and if that's their primary problem, we might be better serving them to help them work with more their emotional aspects of fear and anxiety. Um, we can also sometimes tap into that, those fears and anxieties by, by getting them in a physical position that aesthetically gives them a different perspective of themselves. So sometimes it's like, you know, entering into that cycle, we do have a lot of tools, powerful tools at our disposal, disposal for using physical positioning to get people to perceive themselves in a different way because we know, both know the same curve may be perceived by two different people in a very different way. Some, some teenagers might not be bothered by it at all. Mm -hmm. And others with the same curve might feel like they don't even want to leave the house. So, you know, how does that happen, right? And again, we're talking about how that neurology interprets that those same set of circumstances mm -hmm. in a way that is, is potentially life altering for for each and so the i think to answer your question about beliefs i think we can affect beliefs in a really positive way and and um if we don't then we have no no chance of success at least at the approach we're trying to take and we may be better suited or serve our patients better to try and uh help them in ways 
that are not what we're not what we're doing, but maybe what somebody else can help them with. Okay. Uh, well, that was. I love that discussion, and I think there should be more of those discussions, even in in within the PRI realm, because you know I know the the autonomic nervous system. I always try to tell people this is not just muscles and bones. There's a lot more to these patterns, as we were talking about before we got on air, so to speak, about my right, right, body, right. the anxiety about your body not feeling right. And when you know it's not right and you know what right feels like and you can't feel right again, and then the anxiety builds because you can't change it and you're not sure why. Right, uh, right. And then you're getting more anxious because you're getting more anxious and you know too much about anxiety and <laughs> yeah, yeah. how that affects our posture and you're going, oh no, right. Yeah, and you get stuck in a loop and you get stuck in a loop of like, I guess they would call it yeah. catastrophic thinking. And you could do all the techniques in the world, <laughs> but you know, if you can't calm that system, uh, and it might not just be, everything is physical because you feel it in your body, but you know, who knows where the, the, um, the interaction, not the interaction, what are we, the, the inter, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the interplay, right? The set, where you, where you need to get into the system, whether more through a physical. Oh, the entry point, sort yeah, of the yeah, entry yeah, point. Yeah, and, yeah. and what I would say is it can be anywhere. It, yeah. It's a loop. So, so pick any point. Yeah. And just try to enter in there. And from my training, I'm a physical therapist. So I can help you get into this emotional loop of yours by putting your physical body in a position that's more rest and digest, that's more parasympathetic. If I can get your abdominals to engage, I'm going to calm down your fight or flight muscles. And so I can kind of, it's like a fake it till you make it situation. You yeah. know, I can bring you in to a physical body that makes your anxiety less. Right. And then you will feel better about yourself. And yeah, so because, and that's another th hard thing to explain that we're so maybe bifurcated in a sense, like the psychological, emotional component is somehow different from the physical body component. And I think that persists in society, in, edu in education, even health education. You mean that illusion, right? Yes, that they're somehow separate. And right. Yet we all know that's not true because if you think a disturbing thought, you're going to feel it in your stomach. So we already know that it's not true and that they're inextricably linked. And yet still people, it, the, the whole system is still set up to treat them differently. And that's like PRI is psychological. It is emotional because if you can sense your left heel for the first time and left hamstring and breathe, breathe with that left diaphragm and your neck relaxes, well, that can be a, a game changer for somebody to know that yeah i don't have to be in pain huh well that's going to change your outlook on life yeah it's that's very cool. empowering it is absolutely empowering so you know the work that you do with teenagers is just invaluable because i know it's so much more than just working with the spine you know it, it's right the whole system that's right. it's the whole system uh so that's why that's I, right and that's really why I was really excited to have uh, both you and Lisa and uh, my next guest who will be coming up uh, probably next right. week, two weeks, just to talk about this. Right. It's just so much more than people realize. And yeah. it, it's um, like I said, it, it, like you said, it's, it's absolutely empowering to know that you have some control. Yeah. And it's also a model for any sort of physical presentation. It doesn't matter if it's a frank spine curve. This is what helped me start to see the emotional connection is that when you see this obvious deformity and how it's linked to uh, some of the emotional manifestations, but just because someone doesn't have a frank deformity doesn't mean they don't have those exact same cycles of anxiety and belief change and, and pain. And then we, you know, it, it just helps us understand what all humans are experiencing, but it's just for me, it's, it's, it's more obvious when someone has a spine curve about how I can affect their position to improve their well being, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Well, Jean, thank you very much. I think we covered everything. Was there anything that you know of that, I, that we didn't cover? Um, no, I think we did. I think we did. I think we talked. Um, got terminology in and um i don't feel like i emphasized as much as i would have liked about how the rib cage and the pelvis are attached to that turning spine but 
go ahead. <laughs> because that's all good information. So actually, I would love for you to do that. Why don't we wrap up with that? Okay, so I, I would I would want you know people that are trying to understand spine curves to remember that when you're on this, the, if this is just the spine, right? And, and we look at this from all perspectives and it's turned like we see in someone with a spine curve. Also remember that there's a pelvis that's also turned because of that turning spine. And there's a rib cage that's attached, especially in the area of most curves in the biggest part of that spine curve. And that rib cage is twisting right along with the spine and how much power we have by anchoring that rib cage and inflating that chest wall in a way if we can take that pelvis and bring them out of that position a little bit and then we can anchor that rib cage and expand it we have a lot of tools and levers at our disposal to affect reduction of that curve by shifting control and a patient's capacity to use their hips and pelvis and improve their capacity to to anchor that rib cage and expand that chest wall to take a curve into what we call a, a counter torsion or a counter pattern that actually would make them taller and would decrease the severity of that curve and the other big thing that's attached is this head that's up here so this visual system and the auditory system and the teeth everything are adjusting to a spine that's positioned like this Mm. And when it's not like this, those eyes and that teeth and those ears and that brain say, well, this is normal. Come back here. And we have to keep reminding it. No, we're going to try to make you get used to things over here so that you can exist like that. Uh, well, that's, I, I love the fact that you mentioned that, that when, when you've been in a position for so long and that's become the norm, how does our sensory system adapt to that position? Because it will. Will it ever fight it? Will, will, it, will your sensory system fight change that you're trying to create? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just like a habit, right? You know, well, how, how hard is it to change a habit? And, you know, there are lots of conventions. There's lots of sort of rules of thumb about changing a habit. You know, how many thousand hours of work we need to do or how many days of repetitive practice we need to put in for that habit not to be so obligatory, right? So for us to feel like we have an alternative and then and the evolution is for that alternative to actually feel better to us, mm. for that alternative to feel more efficient, for us to feel less tired, less painful in that alternative, and then for us to actually want that alternative. That's what it comes down to. You have to want the alternative. And if we don't, as therapists, make that alternative appealing and, and empowering and, and that person feels better, then they're not going to go there. They're going to stay in their pattern, like you said, because their neurology, their, their system has accommodated and adapted and is comfortable, even though it's maybe not therapeutic or efficient to be there. Yeah. It's just familiar. It's kind of like a bad habit almost. Yeah. Is there just one last question? Um, since teenagers, the adolescents uh, are, if, if they're in a, if, if they have a scoliotic spine and that will affect the position of their neck and the rest of their body, uh, are there any um, recommendations for dental work, braces, or visual? Like, do you see visual systems adapting, like rapid change in visual systems because of scoliosis, or jaws that are starting to shift because of scoliosis? And what, you know, uh, that that may have to be taken into consideration when considering either dental work or, or glasses? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in vision or dental, but I can say if you think, if you just think about what's going on with the head, you know, that's attached to this twisting system. And, you know, we, we know the bite's going to get off. We know we see cross bites. In other words, where the lower jaw and the upper jaw are not lining up between the middle of the teeth. We see that a lot more in, in patients who have scoliosis than in the average population. And so, um, what we want to be careful is that uh, an adolescent with a growing spine doesn't get their teeth looking perfect on a system that is really, if those teeth want to be here because the dentist or the orthodontist has really lined them up to be perfect here, when we put those teeth in a little bit of a different position by trying to straighten that spine and the teeth say, I don't like this because my teeth don't line up anymore, then a lot of times the teeth can just pull that head 
right back into the alignment that it's looking for to get a good bite, which means that spine needs to go back to its original position. So dentist orthodontia that's perfect on a system that is lacking in its potential is counterproductive. So right. it can be really frustrating for families to come in with a teenager who they've just had two or three years of, of orthodontia and expenses and and we're asking them to come out of that perfect bite so that we can improve that body alignment of that head over that rib cage over that pelvis but that may require getting them out of their perfect bite letting their system get used to that their maximum potential and then reacquiring if we need to aesthetically that occlusion yeah. once their system is is Works. as efficient as it can be right yeah. right it, that's it's a great question and it's a it's a hard subject to broach because um, it's, you know, it's, it doesn't seem related to a curve in my back, you know, what's on my teeth or what's on my, what's on my eyes, but we really don't want the system being too comfortable in the, the biggest manifestation of that curve. Mm, okay. All right. Yeah. That's, that's a good, cause I've, uh, I think I got braces put on a system that was already curved. You know, I think I was patterned at seven years. Well, I can see it in my, my, you know, my pictures of my childhood. My face ended up asymmetrical very young because I know I had that visual issue. It makes sense now. I couldn't understand why I looked like that so young. You know, I had that right. at such a young age. You know, right. They didn't know I needed glasses and no one knew. And then they put braces on me, but I was already in that torsion pattern, I believe. And I think right. it locked me in and yep. then course developed a cross yeah. as my jaw tried to get back the space that had been taken away from it and you know yeah. who knows what could have been okay so now I think we covered everything we wanted to cover so Jean I really appreciate you coming on yeah. and I think everyone will really enjoy this all right I'm interested to see how you uh how you put it all together yeah uh, it'll probably be it almost feels like we didn't even talk about scoliosis <laughs> <laughs> But that's, that's yeah. okay. Maybe not in the way that people think of scoliosis. We're, we're broadening the perspective right. of what scoliosis entails. And that's, 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 right. that's important.